We're going we're gonna to start a new series uh, today, and I think it's incredibly appropriate for uh, where we are as a culture, uh, where we are as a nation, and I, I really think it's kind of the, uh, it's indicative of where we are in the world and in the timeline of the dispensation of the grace of God. I think it's uh, incredibly important that we kind of talk about this stuff because what I'm discovering uh, currently and right now, I'm discovering that <clears throat> people are, uh, they're just confused. Uh, people are having a hard time distinguishing uh, what God is saying. Um, and there's so much noise. And you can have people that communicate their, the same faith, a same commitment to Christ, a same devotion to prayer, a same devotion to, or a similar devotion to the Word, and have such diametrically opposing views, political views, cultural views, social views, it is remarkable to me. It, it is remarkable to me that the one thing that Jesus prayed for, and think about it, in John chapter 17, the one thing that Jesus prayed for uh, above almost anything else he prayed for in his last prayer was that we would be one as he and the Father are one. He prayed for the unity of the church. And if there's anything that is obvious to me right now is the church is not. It just isn't. And uh, now, it, it, you know, what, what creates unity? Well, uh, is, it, is it exact opinion, exact similar opinion? No, that's not what creates unity. And, and, we can, and we can get into those factors, and we will get into those factors. But really what I want to deal with over the next couple of weeks is I want to talk about a thing we call noise. Just noise. Uh, how many are familiar with the word? How many are familiar with the experience? Because noise is an experience, right? And there's all different kinds of noise. And I'm talking about noise in, this, in, in a unique context. So what we're going to try to discover is we're going to try to discover how to hear from God through noise. We're going to try to discover God through the noise of chaos and crisis and confusion. How do I hear God in this current social, political, economic, spiritual environment? How do, how do I hear from God? Because I don't know about you, but if there's anybody you need to hear from right now, that's really the guy you want to hear from. You know, if there's anybody you want to pay attention to, if there's anybody you want to kind of hone in and figure out what's what, that's your resource. Better than Fox, better than CNN, better than the internet, better than Google, better than Facebook for sure. Now, if you're watching on Facebook, God, this is the only redemptive thing you can do on Facebook. Well, God bless you. I, I, uh, so we're going we're gonna to talk about the idea of noise and, and, and specific. So noise is any sound. Okay, it's any sound, but it's especially loud, harsh, confused, and it's basically what could be summed up as clamor. That's noise. So the thing about noise that dis is distinctive from sound is sound is identifiable. In other words, I understand what that is when I hear it. If you hear a trumpet, you understand that's a trumpet. If you hear a saxophone, you understand that's a saxophone. If you hear an airplane, you understand that's an airplane. If you hear a jet, you understand. If you hear a, a, a locomotive, a train, you understand that's the, no that, that's the sound of a train, right? Noise doesn't have any distinction. It doesn't identify what it really is. And in fact, you can, uh, you can forecast or you can project what you imagine and associate it with that noise. In fact, the noise will activate imagination. The noise will activate speculation. The noise is looking for your definition. What are you going to do with what you're hearing? What do you believe about what you're hearing? 
And, and this, is an important, this is an important distinction. So today, we're going to talk about, for the next several weeks, we're going to talk about noise from a lot of different places. But I'm going to talk about the noise in the basement. Because noise can come from a lot of places. How many's ever heard a noise in the basement? Come on, we're in the Midwest. Everybody's got one. Right? So there, there, there's just this noise, unless you've got a ranch. Even if you've got a ranch, you've probably got a basement. Because we like to go there when the, you know, the, the tornadoes come and stuff like that. So, so this idea of the noise in the basement. So I, the only way I can, the best way I can frame this <clears throat> is my first uh, experience uh, with noise in a basement that, that, that changed everything I was going to do based on what I heard. So let me give you the backdrop of this. I'm going to let you into my world for a little bit. I was, uh, I was uh, my, my family on Saturday night, we did, we did two things on the weekend. My family did two things on the weekend when I was younger. We went to the stock car races every Saturday night. So we'd spend the afternoon popping popcorn and putting it in brown paper bags. And, and we would take a little cooler and we'd sneak it in to the stock car races, Pikes Peak International Speedway. And if you, anyhow, I'm just letting you into my world. And we would, we would spend the evening at the stock car races watching cars go around in a circle. And this is how morbid uh, a 10-year-old is in that environment. I just was so bored. Now, if you love racing, God bless you. It's just not my thing. Uh, but I was so bored, I would pray for Rex. <laughs> it's a 10-year-old kid, you know. It was about, they were there for my entertainment. And I, I'm not thinking about anything else. So, so I, hey, when there was a wreck, I got interested. But, uh, you know, if there wasn't a wreck, you know, it was just bored me to tears. So, I, 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 and then the second thing we would do is we would get up early on Sunday morning, we'd go to church. So we had stock car races and church. Sounds like Southern Gospel, doesn't it? Stock car races and church. And so that's what we did. We did stock car races and church. And, I, <clears throat> and, and then we did church all day Sunday because we just didn't go to Sunday school. We went to Sunday school. Then we went to the church Sunday morning service. Then, then, we, did, then we did Kentucky Fried Chicken for lunch. And then, and then we'd go back to church in the evening because that's what you did. You Sundays were for church. <clears throat> And, uh, and, and Saturday nights were for stock car racing. So anyhow, I hated stock car racing. I hated it. I did not enjoy it. Never loved it, even though my, my, my parents and, my, and my, my, you know, our friends, everybody loved it. So I was always trying to figure out how can I skip Scott stock car racing. And, and so finally, I, I, I just so hounded my mom and dad. I, I said, listen, can, can so-and-so come over, a friend of mine, can he spend the night and, you know, <clears throat> I got a little cough. Maybe he can stay with me and, 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 and you know, and we'll just stay in ha- inside and, and please, 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 please. And if we get in trouble, we can go down the street to so-and-so. Or if we need something, we can go down the street to so-and-so. And, and so my, my, my parents finally just gave in. You know, okay, you, you just stay home. You can have him over, you know, blah, 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 blah. So a 10-year-old, you know, back then you could do that. You'd never think of that today, but back then you did that. And uh, so... We, we stayed there. Well, it turned out that, you know, we're having a great time. Me and my buddy, we're just doing what, you know, boys do, just goofing and, and having a good time. And, you know, we felt like kings of the castle, so to say. And, and, and until, uh, you know, a storm rose up. And a storm started happening. And, and it, I mean, it wasn't just kind of like a light rain. I mean, it was like a deluge and, and thunder and lightning. And, 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 you know, and it was all good. You know, I mean, it was a storm and we, we were okay with that. Uh, uh, until the lights went out. Right? So whatever happened took the lights out. And the lights go out, and, and, and when the lights go out, you know, we, you know, we're trying, we, we didn't, you know, we're not going to light a match or anything. So we were looking for a flashlight, and, and, and we finally found a flashlight. And so we're, you know, kind of, oh, this is kind of fun. It's kind of cool. Even though we were a little, kind of a little anxious, a little scared, until something went boom, 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 <laughs> downstairs. And downstairs was already creepy. How many know what I'm talking about? You know, if mom say, hey, would you go downstairs and bring up some dog food for the dog? You know, I'd walk down the stairs real careful. i get a dog food. I'd run up the stairs because I didn't want to be downstairs. The basement was creepy, even with all the lights on. Because, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't like these fancy man caves of today. I mean, it was, 
It was brick and lumber and, and, and open things and scary places and spider webs. And that's what the basement was. And, 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 you just, I, just, and I always swore there was something under the stairs anyhow. <laughs> and, and so I'm, I, I hear the boom, 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 boom down the stairs. And I looked at my friend. I said, did you hear that? He goes, yeah, man, somebody's downstairs. I said, no, nobody could be downstairs. And then we heard crash. Oh. And then boom, 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 boom again. <laughs> now there is somebody downstairs. They've broken into the window. And they're climbing. They're starting to walk up the stairs. So you know what me and my buddy did. We ran. We ran out of the house in the middle of this huge storm. We run out of the house and we're, we're, we're afraid. We don't know where to run and, and we're afraid the lightning's going to hit us. And, and, and we finally ran down. We didn't even like these people, but we ran down. Uh, he was called Grandpa Grass. And the reason was because he had perfect grass. But the point is we ran down to his, <laughs> ran down to Grandpa Grass. We knocked on the door. We were so desperate we went to somebody we didn't even like. And we're drenched. We're just soaked through to the bone. We didn't have coats on. We didn't have an umbrella. We didn't have any of that. And uh, he took us in, and we stayed there until the lights came on. And we said, no, you, you know, hey, all right, now go home. And no, <laughs> no, because there's somebody in the basement. So we had to wait until my parents got back. They finally came back because the rain washed it out, and they got back. And so when we found out, and they called, we, you know, we, they called the house. Anyhow, we got back home, and. And when we walked in, we, you know, my parents, what are you doing? Why are you running around outside in the rain and the storm? And no, it was somebody's downstairs. We heard the window break. We heard down, go up and down the steps twice. So my dad, because dads are never afraid of the sounds in the basement, my dad goes downstairs. What happened was there was a couple pairs of shoes at the top of the stairs. <laughs> And when there was a couple of large cracks of lightning and that thunder that kind of shaked the house, it, it shook the shoes and the shoes tumbled down the steps. <laughs> but what about the crash? What about the crash? The glass breaking. So he walked into one of the bedrooms and sure enough, a limb had fallen off of a tree because of the wind and, and it had hit the glass and it broke the glass. It was a perfect storm of events. That altered the way we were going to relate to the noise in the basement. Perfectly explainable, but not to a 10-year-old alone in a dark house. That already had the disposition to believe that nothing good is in the basement. Here, here's, here's the point to the story. What you believe about the noises you're hearing will determine the now that you live and the future that you're going to experience. I'm going to say it again. What you believe about the noise that you're hearing is going to determine what you do now and what your future can look like. Look at what Job says. Job says, the sound of terror rings in their ears. And even on a good day, even on good days, they fear the attack of the destroyer. In other words, they hear something and it's the sound or the noise of terror. And so even if it's a good day, what they believe about what they're hearing is creating this fear that they're going to be destroyed. Look what Isaiah 24, 18 says. He who flees at the sound of the terror shall fall into the pit. When we react to the noise... When we react fearfully to the sounds that want to create and induce terror and fear in us, what we do is we run from a safe place into a pit. And he who climbs out of the pit shall be caught by the snare. This is not a very nice scripture. For the windows of heaven are open and the foundations of the earth tremble. And so he's talking about the judgment of God and how you can't escape it. It's the ultimate proclamation here. When I talk about the noise in the basement, I'm talking about where the environment establishes the perception. I'm going to say it again. Where the environment establishes the perception. So if the environment is dark and scary 
and a little foreboding, it creates the perception that it is scary, that something is bad down there. It's just a basement. It's just wood. It's just concrete. It's just drywall. It's just some doors. But because I don't frequent it, because I don't live in it, because it's the thing I always want to avoid because it doesn't feel comfortable to me. It begins to create a perception. The environment itself begins to create the perception. So I want to ask you, in our current cultural, social, spiritual environment, what's the perception it's creating? The COVID environment. Now listen, I've had it. No fun. Wouldn't advise it to anybody. It did not kill me. It didn't. And, and, and I'm not saying that there aren't, it doesn't have danger associated with it. It does. There's no question. Just like any other flu or virus you could get. But the problem is, is we've got so much noise in our world that it's creating a perception. The question is, is that perception a real or an imagined one? Now, I know some people are going to argue, uh, you know, the scientific facts, the medical facts, and so on and so forth. And trust me, you can find stuff on both ends of this. But when I'm talking about environment, I'm talking about fear, guilt, shame, sin. I'm talking about the things in us that feed the perception in our environments. What I find out is when things get chaotic po politically, when things get chaotic socially, when things get cha chaotic economically or spiritually, that's when the things that are in us become magnified. They tend to want to inform in the environment. So if I'm filled with fear, then fear is going to be the way I perceive my environment. If I'm full of shame, if I'm full of guilt, if I'm full of sin, it's going to frame the way I understand my environment. If I'm filled with rejection and pain and confusion and greed, it's going to frame the way I relate to the world around me. If I'm filled with bitterness or envy or selfishness or pride, all of these things will begin to create the environment that will build my perception. It will build our association with the dark, scary places that we don't like to go to. And it'll feed it. It'll craft the monster under the bed. It'll craft the scary monster that's in the closet. And by the way, they only exist when it's dark, right? And we always know that the answer to the monster is to turn the lights on. And I'm going to suggest the answer to the monsters of our environment, the answer to the monsters of our culture and our society is to just turn the light on. We know what the light is, but let's go to James. And I, I'm going to end up preaching here in a minute. James chapter 3. It's great to be doing this again. Look what it says in verse 13. <clears throat> I, I love the way James is so straightforward. You never have to really wonder what James is thinking. James is just going to tell it to you straight. You might not like him. Now, he's the pastor of the first church. He's the pastor of the Jerusalem church. So he has a lot of influence. Uh, the, the apostles are certainly the leaders of the entire church, but James is a part of this culture, this leadership culture, and he's obviously the, the lead pastor of the church of Jerusalem. So this is his pastoral advice. Let's listen to a great pastor and hear what he has to say. He says, who is wise and understanding among you? Okay, let, uh, our self-perception might be, hey, I'm pretty wise, I'm pretty understanding. Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your heart, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom, what wisdom? The wisdom that is filled with bitter envy and self-seeking in our heart. The, the wisdom that we boast or we uh, present what we think above the truth of what God says. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. So you have here four levels of wisdom. There's four levels of wisdom right here. The wisdom that's from above, heaven, God's wisdom. You have the wisdom that's earthly, sensual, and demonic. The four levels of wisdom. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. What? 
You mean all that has to exist to create an environment for everything bad is envy and self-seeking. These are the platforms that on-ramp everything that's evil in the world, according to James. Think about that. I always thought it was something else. I always thought it was the devil, or I thought it was this, or I thought. But God says, no, if I've got envy, if I've got this, this uh, what I would call a deniable jealousy. In other words, I, I'm so jealous over somebody, I want to deny you what you have. Yeah. Yeah. If you're enjoying something, I want you to lose it because that'll make me feel better. Right. Envy and self-seeking. I don't care about you. I don't care about your family, your home, your environment, your community. I care about me, what matters to me, what is important to me, how I feel about what I'm experiencing right now. That's the priority. When those two things exist, anything and everything bad is on ramped. Doesn't mean everything shows up, but it becomes the portal. For everything. So if I'm relating to the noise in my world through these two cylinders, the two eyes of evil, envy and self-seeking, if I'm looking through the filter of those two things, I'm inviting every other evil thing. I'm framing my world. My perception becomes skewed. But then look at, look at God's answer. How many are always glad that God provides an answer? Here it is. Here's God's answer. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy, good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Hmm. Okay. So let's talk about these four types of wisdom real quick. Because this is the way we deal with, listen, noise has to have perspective. See, when you're a 10-year-old, you're only going to understand things through a very limited window. But when your father's 27, 28, 30, 35, whatever it is, he's got a completely different perspective of the basement. He's not afraid of the dark in the basement. He's not afraid. He doesn't immediately assume that the dump, 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 dump is the bad thing. He's just going to go investigate. He's going to go look because he's seeking understanding and wisdom. He's going, to let the, he's going to let the environment, what he sees in the environment, define what he heard. And he's going to seek it honestly. So what are the four types of wisdom? This is why we need wisdom. This is why we need wisdom today. When I say wisdom, I'm talking about the highest facility of applicable knowledge through understanding. The highest facility of applicable knowledge through understanding. So, in other words, wisdom is applied knowledge based on clarity of understanding. Okay, so wisdom isn't just knowing something. Wisdom is doing something about what you know. And it's not just doing something. It's doing the right thing about what you know. I'll say that again because I didn't get enough amens. Come on, I need some praise emojis. I need some praying hands. I need some, I don't know, whatever you guys do on the, on the, on the internet. It's all good. So wisdom, the highest facility of applicable knowledge. So it's good response. It's right response. It's correct response. So I just, I just don't do something. I do the right thing in response to what's going on. So the, here's, here's the four types. The first one is earthly. This is the primary cylinder for wisdom in the world. It's the primary cylinder. This is where most people... Uh, collect their wisdom. It's based on human natural knowledge, period. A and it doesn't matter what God says. In other words, it's not looking for God to inform its wisdom. It's simply drawing and extracting from knowledge, from human experience. From so and I'm not saying that all of that stuff in and of itself is bad. It's when it comes into contrast or conflict with what God says that it moves over into Earthly. See, when it, when it conflicts with God, the choice has to be made. Is it God or is it 
what I understand in my natural ability. Well, I'm going I'm to be really uh, honest with you. It's easier to go to the natural. I got three amens, but the online, they're like, oh, pastor, preach, you got this. Right? Because, because it's just easier to go there. Why? Because we've been, we've been crafted and constructed in earthly wisdom. We've, we've, been, we've been filtered and we've been processed this way. And then we get saved and then God starts moving on us with a new form of knowledge. A new way of seeing the world. A new way of seeing him. A new way of seeing life. A new way of seeing purpose. Now all of a sudden I'm being asked to think differently and use a thing called faith, hope, and love to frame how I relate to everything else. See, hope is not, I heard this today, hope is not a feeling, hope is a focus. That's a good, that's a good thought. Hope is a focus. So, earthly, that's the first place. So, God says, hey, there's this, it, it's not that this doesn't work, it's just not the highest level of wisdom. The second one is sensual. Now, the word sensual here means, it's, it's, it has the word suke in it, which means uh, emotional. It's essentially based on emotion. So how do most people filter love emotionally? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do most people uh, filter uh, value or life or uh, connectivity? They do it through emotions. And, and we begin, we've, we now live in a world where we literally have gone from natural wisdom, which can create some levels of normalcy, to now we live, really, our culture, and I'm speaking about our American culture, lives primarily now in sensual wisdom. Where that, I don't, I don't under, when, you, when you talk to people, they'll say things, well, I don't feel that way. That is the primary way they relate to you. Well, I just don't feel that way. Well, I feel like you're wrong. Or I feel like you're judging me. Or I feel like, I feel like you're this. Or I feel like you're that. And so now we're making wholehearted statements based on how I feel about something. And my feelings drive every context of my relationship. You live in this world, you'll have zero friends. You live in this world, you will not even have a healthy marriage. You live in this world, you will alienate yourself from anything and anyone unless they align with how you feel about things all the time. Here's the problem with feelings. They're feelings. They're going to come and they're going to go. But people will make life decisions based on how I feel angry. Well, great. What are you going to do with that anger? Well, if we live in sensual wisdom, we're going to react out of anger. I feel hate. Well, then what are you going to do? If I feel love, well, what am I going to do? I'm going to love. Am I going to love based on God's format of what love is? And if you want to know what that is, just go to 1 Corinthians 13. It'll tell you. Love is patient, love is kind, love is not conceited, it's not rude, it doesn't seek its own way. Doesn't rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. It loves, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures everything. A love doesn't fail. But, but if I love, it's all about how I feel when I'm around you, if I'm using sensual wisdom. As long as you make me feel love, then I will return and reciprocate And this is the world we live in now. We've gone from natural, and there's still a lot of natural, but, but we've literally moved into sensual. And, of course, that, that translates into sexual things and all kinds of stuff. But then the final one, which is the, fa- our, you know, not our favorite, but the scary one, demonic. This is God's word. It's not mine. Demonic wisdom. So this is understanding knowledge framed by demonic influence. In other words, there is a spiritual orientation. Have you ever talked to people and you're like, what planet are you on? I'm, I'm, no, seriously, what are you talking about? Where did this come from? And they, they live in this ethereal world, and we can talk about new age, and we could talk about uh, spiritism, and we can talk about these kind of what we call gentle demonic 
delivery systems. But their, their, their primary purpose is to war against the purposes of God. That's its primary purpose. And the other thing that is absolutely real about demonic wisdom is it ha- it's spiritually oriented and it produces evil fruit. Why would people gather for justice and then do injustice? It's not consistent. But when you're living in demonic or sensual wisdom, it doesn't have to be. I know, I'm, I probably offended. Three, three people just jumped offline. The final one is godly. Uh, am I out of time already? Wow, I'm not even done with my message. I'm not even halfway through it. Godly, godly wisdom. This should be what we strive for right here, godly wisdom. Godly wisdom flows from the nature, somebody say it with me, nature, will, and word of God. So there's three dynamic influences that produce godly wisdom. The nature of God, in other words, what is God in his nature? What motivates him to do what he does? Come on, let's, let's, let's use God as the model. His will, right, what the decisions he makes how he makes decisions, and the final one is his word. The Bible says he even magnifies his word above his name or his nature. He's saying, listen, what you need to know is that my word is consistent because my nature doesn't change. You can rely on what I'm saying to you. And it's discernible because I don't have to guess what God's thinking. I can read it. I can see demonstrated in his example and in his nature and his decisions what he does. And this frames how I should react. That's why God had to send Jesus. That's why he had to send Jesus. Because Jesus modeled it in the flesh. So, you know, because God can be ethereal. He can be kind of like this, this misty, smoky thing. But Jesus is flesh and blood. We got, to, we got to see his example. So the stories of the gospel are critical because they give us this clarity of who God is in his nature and his will. We get this clarity about who God is, right? And, and, and here's the other piece. It's discernible. Wisdom is discernible. Why? Because of the good fruit it produces. It's wise. You know it's born out of godly wisdom if it's producing good fruit. It's not on a card. It's not on a placard. It's not in a position. It's producing good fruit fruit. I have to finish. I I would love to. So, this is the wisdom. This, this is the wisdom that overcomes the lies in the noise. The things that your mind's telling you, the things that your fears are informing, the things that your anxieties are communicating, the things that your guilt is framing. This wisdom overcomes those lies. It gives discernment and clarity to what you're hearing. So here's what the wisdom, this wisdom of God produces. Here, here it is. I, I'll just take it from the scriptures and sum it up for you. Purity. So if I'm walking the wisdom of God, I walk in purity. I'm peaceful. I'm gentle. I'm willing to yield. Oh, let's scratch that one. Merciful. Producing good without prejudice or hypocrisy. That's what the wisdom of God produces. In real terms, every day, in every conversation, in every interaction, in every relationship, thank you, Pastor, I'm glad you're back. So, I'm going to try to do this in five minutes. Is it okay if we go a little long? So let's discern the noise in the basement. Let's go there, okay? So can I frame this for you? We're going to go to Exodus 32 here in just a minute. But I want to to set this up for you. Okay, God has just delivered Israel, two million plus people. He's delivered them 
out of Egypt through the Red Sea. They've wandered around in the wilderness for a little bit. It's been about a month or so. They end up at the base of what is known as the mountain of God, Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb. They're at the basin of the mountain of God. And God calls Moses to come up to, actually he calls the whole nation. I love this. This is, read, read the preceding chapters to chapter 32 of Exodus, and you'll discover something interesting. You will discover that the invitation to go up the mountain and receive the law was not to Moses. It was to the entire nation of Israel. God invited all of them up to the top of the fiery mountain to hear from God and watch him craft his word, his law, on tables of stone with his own finger. The invitation was to everybody. You know what the response of Israel as a nation was? Yo, uh, you go, Moses. This is a little intimidating. We like the basement. We like the valley. You go on up to the top penthouse suite. You deal with God. And whatever you say is good with us. Whatever you come back with works. Now, now, the only one who went up with Moses was Joshua. Joshua went up to attend Moses as they were up in the mountains. So two of the primary leaders, Moses, obviously, and Joshua have gone up. Now, there's one leader that stayed behind. His name was Aaron. And so they go up to the top of this mountain, and 40 days down the road, Moses comes and meets Joshua, who's at some distance away. We don't know why, but he's at some distance away. And, and he has tables of stone in his hands, written with the finger of God, the law of God. This is cool. This is, this is a first printing press thing. You know, it's pretty awesome. And so, so they meet up, and here's the conversation. When Joshua, so, so Moses and him meet up, and then When they start to come down off the mountain, when Joshua heard the, when Joshua heard the, of the people as they shouted. Now, what's happening down below? Well, you know, after a couple weeks, they're like, you know, he ain't coming back. He went up the hill and the fire consumed him. You know, the trembling and the shaking and the earthquaking and, you know, can anybody survive that? And so they kind of they say, you know, hey, you know, uh, he's not there. So Mo, Aaron, it's up to you to lead us now. And, and, and you know what? Uh, we, we understand Egypt because we've lived in that culture for 430 years. And, and so why don't, you, why don't you give us an idol? Give us something that can lead us. Something that we can ascribe our success to. Somebody, something that, that, that we can worship. Something that will allow for the desires and the darkness in our own heart to uh, not be condemned, not be dealt with, but, but to be celebrated. And so, the, you know, as you know, the story goes, they started throwing gold at him. And uh, see, it, it's not hard to collect money even for evil purpose. And, and, and so they throw their, their gold at him, and he crafts a golden calf, and they're dancing, and they're partying, and the orgy's going on. And, and uh, so then, you know, Joshua and Moses are hearing this, and Joshua says there's a noise of war in the camp. But he said, Moses, it's not the sound of the shouting of victory or the sound of the cry of defeat, but it's the sound of singing that I hear. Hmm. we got two men that are up on the mountain hearing the same noise and discerning something completely different. Same noise, different discernment. Now, I'm going to tell you why we get different discernment when we are coming from the same place. And I'm even talking the presence of God. For instance, you guys are going to walk out of this room today and you're going to say, wasn't that an amazing message on? Oh, no, no, that's not what, no, what I heard, you know what really spoke to me was, I love it when people come up to me after a message and say, I just love when you said, and I go, I'm not sure I said that. (laughs) Happens all the time. Letting you a little, I'm letting you peek behind the curtain. Professional, so here's, here's what creates 
From the same place, different discernment, right? Professional vocation. What is Joshua? He's a warrior. He's a fighter. So what is he here? When he hears the noise, he hears what his vocation has built into him. He hears war. That sounds like war to me. Because that's how he relates to things. And sometimes what you've trained and what you've, what you've done and your uh, professional experience is telling you, is framing you, is setting you up to not discern what's actually happening. Because you're using the frame of your professionalism to determine what has to be spiritually discerned. Here's another thing. Private focus. What I mean by that is, is, is they, they, uh, what you uh, focus on or uh, concentrate on or develop when you're alone. What do you do with your alone time? Because that will frame how you discern noise. If, if you spend 12 hours a day listening to the news, that is where your discernment's going to be. If you spend 12 hours a day watching horror movies, that's what's going to frame, it's going to influence simple, simple constructions of what influences how we discern things. And those are just two simple examples. But here's, here's another one. Not only, not only private focus, what I, what I concentrate on when I'm alone, but also personal experience. What has happened and inexperience. The things I know because this happened to me and the things that I don't know because it didn't happen to me. So some of us negate something because, well, that's never happened to me. And because it's never happened to you, it never existed. And it can't exist. Is that true? Of course not. And the other is true as well. We sometimes say, well, when this happens to me, every time this happens, that means this is going to happen again. And that's not true either. And our, our personal experience or inexperience can filter our perception and distort truth. I got to hurry. So, how do I discern? Not let these things frame how I discern things. How do I discern the noise? The first one is, the first way is this way. Presence creates clarity and discernment. Moses came from the presence of God and he said, that isn't war. That's the sound of singing. There's a party going on. I hear KC and the Sunshine Band. <laughs> and the younger ones amongst us are, who's KC and the Sunshine Band? Presence creates clarity and discernment. Look at this. The second thing that he did is they made a decision. Verse 19. They begin to move. Let's go and see what this sound is. So if you're going to discern something, you have to move towards the noise. Not run from it. You have to move towards the noise, but you just don't move towards the noise with personal experience or inexperience. You don't just move towards the noise with your private focus. You don't just move towards the noise with your professional vocational understanding of things. You move towards the noise with the thing that Moses had. He was carrying the word of God and was, had just come from the presence of God. So he is moving towards the noise, letting two things that he had been in for 40 days and he was carrying in his life, he let that inform what he was going to hear and see. Hmm. What are, you, what are you doing with the noise in the basement? The thing that makes you want to run out and go to Grandpa Grass? Are you running from the noise? I don't want, to, I don't want this to happen to me again. Or I'm scared because the basement's always been creepy anyhow. Are you running from the noise or are you coming from the place of God's presence and his word? And you say, you know what, I'm going to approach this noise. I know it sounds scary, it sounds weird, it sounds terrible, it sounds foreboding, it sounds uncertain. But I'm going to move towards it with the word of God 
and in the presence of God. I'm not talking about some spooky thing. I'm talking letting God and his presence and his word frame how I relate. I'm done. I'm done. I've, already, I've taken up all the time. What's the noise motivating in you? Are you running or are you moving towards it? Are you running from it or are you moving towards it? If you're moving towards it, you've got to move towards it with something more than your fears. You've got to move towards it with something more than your personal experience. There's a lot of noise around us. You can bury your head in the sand like an ostrich or you can move towards it with the word of God and let God discern, let God give clarity. So let's do that. Let's stand to our feet all over the room. Hallelujah. Father, here we are in this room right now. Here we are watching online. And Lord, there's some of us that are hearing noises in our basement, the basement of our bank account, the basement of our jobs, the basement of political uncertainty, social uncertainty, cultural uncertainty. We're in the basement. We're hearing noises coming from places that we're just not comfortable in. And we just don't know how to relate to it. So Lord, I'm asking you, you you told us in the same book that we read about these four levels of wisdom, you said in the very first chapter that if if we lacked wisdom, all we had to do was ask you for it. So, Lord, I I reject earthly wisdom, sensual wisdom, and demonic wisdom. And I embrace godly wisdom that comes from your word and your presence, comes from your nature and your decisions. Holy Spirit, I ask you right now to still the fearful heart, to heal the broken heart. Lord, to Raise up men and women of God strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Holy Spirit, have your way in this room. Have your way in our spirits. Lord, we're, we're going to take the next 10 minutes and we're just going to press into your presence. Lord, I pray your word finds a resting place in our heart and that we would press into your presence and in your presence... And through your word, we would start moving towards the noise. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. If you're online, I encourage you to just let somebody know you're ready to pray with somebody. Maybe you don't know Jesus and you're ready to make that connection with him. But today, if you're hearing noise and your heart is responding in all the wrong ways, instead of having confidence and peace and trust, you've got fear and anxiety and dread, can I challenge you that today's a day of deliverance and freedom for you? We're going to worship, we're going to pray, we're going to give, we're going to do communion, we're going to do the things that we do, but let's press into his presence together. In Jesus' name, come on, let's do it.